Love the British monarchy? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the To Die For Daily podcast with Kinsey Schofield. Take it away, Kinsey. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Kinsey Schofield with the To Die For Daily podcast. Katie Nichol, I have watched you for years on television, admired you, um, and read your books. You are, have, you've you just been so in the know. And I wanted to stress at the be- very beginning of this interview that I've dealt with you privately. I've watched you publicly. I've never heard you say a negative thing about anyone. And I, I don't know if it's your upbringing. It's this, um, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, or if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. But yeah, you definitely are definitely the latter, definitely yeah. the latter. If, but you if are you a have kind nothing nice person. To say, yeah, if you have nothing nice to say, just don't say anything at all. I was very, very much brought up to, to with that sort of mentality in mind. But that's it's a very lovely way to introduce me. And thank you very much. Because, you know, I'm aware that, um, you know, in, in this world of internet and trolling and everything else that comes with it, you do have to have an incredibly thick skin. But I think I've always approached my job with, um, you know, with a moral compass at the heart of what I do. And, um, you know, you as you know, you have, whether it's through your podcast or through your the pieces that you write, you know, I think you carry a great responsibility um, with that might of the pen or the podcast or whatever it may be. So um, thank you for your kind words. I, I do appreciate it. Well, you get that sense too in the new royals because you're um, it's very fair about all parties involved and very thorough. And what I was surprised about was your ability to really humanize these people that maybe because of the crown, maybe because of the magazines, they've become characters. And uh, how did how were you able to do that? How were I mean, you got really good access? Yeah, I mean, it was really important to me, I think, particularly in terms of exploring the Queen's legacy, which is what Mm. the first part of the book is about, that I tried to bring the Queen as a person alive to people as as much as I could as a real person, not just the person on our stamps or on our coinage or, you know, in our living rooms on Christmas Day, but to really understand something of of her and who she was. And, you know, that, that did take a lot of work. It took a lot of trust. Um, on the part of the people that I spoke to. I mean, I think so many of these um, royal books, and there are many of them, particularly at the moment, rely on unnamed sources. Um, and I understand why, but I was I was really pleased to be able to, to change that in my book and actually to be able to quote people by their names on the record. I mean, there's a, there are interviews with the Queen's late cousin, Lady Elizabeth Anson, who's never given a, a sit-down interview before about the Queen. Um, I spoke to courtiers, who'd worked with her over the years, some of whom agreed to be named. Her cameraman, who worked with her for four decades, who had the most remarkable insight into the Queen's life and her work, sat down and gave me a series of interviews. So I I would say I was lucky because I think there is an element of luck in this, but it's more than luck. It's grafting, it's earning people's trust. It's really, really hard work. And, And there are, by the way, also unnamed sources in my book as well, because I had to speak to people who still work in the royal household, who are still part of the king's inner circle, the Wales' inner circle, and they're just not in a position to go on the record. But I was I was proud to get to speak to people who are really very close to principles. And I'm pleased that you feel that you understand more of them as people, because they are people. And I think, you know, we're all guilty of forgetting that and of dehumanizing them and, and seeing them as as royals rather than people and they're royals but they're people with real emotions and and real feelings just like the rest of us and I read somewhere and if you could tell me if that's true I would appreciate it but I read somewhere that you when you began your career as a royal commentator and a a royal reporter there was interest there from you but it wasn't like you were passionate about it and you became more passionate about the monarchy through covering them and through seeing their 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 work with charity and how and you know really the great things they do in the world is is that true yeah it's true i mean i certainly wasn't a monarchist to start out with and i felt totally fell into this career i i was a show business reporter at the time and ended up at a party with prince harry and sort of had this wonderful window into his life he was at Eton at the time he was meant to be studying for his exams and instead he was out drinking which you know that was classic Harry and um, so that sort of lit the touch paper for my interest in the young royals and um, 
obviously I you know I spent some wonderful years in and out of nightclubs um with the with the princes on the polo pitch um observing them at very close quarters and of course this was well before serious girlfriends this was when they were young free sometimes slightly wild royals so it made reporting on them very very exciting and of course the narrative has has changed significantly but um I, I hadn't set out with an intention of covering the royals. As I say, I, I very much fell into it. And I think as, I, as I've as i covered them and covered their engagements and travelled on tour with them and really seen just how hard they actually work, um, yes, definitely, I've I've um, become far more, I think, respectful of, in, of the institution. And um, I suppose, yes, a, a, a monarchist. I, I, and... I think, uh, you know, I am, the book is very optimistic about the future of the yes. royal family. I didn't want to write a book about, you know, how it's going to fail, how it's all going to implode, how it's all going to, you know, fritter out with the reign of King Charles III. Um, firstly, because I don't want to do a pessimistic book, that's not really me. And secondly, because I don't believe that's going to be the case. As right. I conclude in the book, you know, particularly with the promise of William and Kate and that new generation of of young royals to look forward to, I think that the future for the House of Windsor is a really positive one. And you, you, you are positive, but you talk about some of those obstacles in the way for King Charles. Um, you know, what do you think is his biggest obstacle? Well, I, I spoke to a constitutional historian called Dr. Anna Whitelock, and I thought one of the most powerful things she said in her interview is that the greatest threat to Charles's reign is apathy. And I think she's absolutely right, that idea that people just will clock off. They just won't be interested in, in the monarchy. They won't really understand the monarchy and they will have no interest in it. And, you know, that that potentially spells a republic and, and the end of the monarchy. Now, everything we've seen in these first weeks of King Charles's reign, I think, suggests everything but apathy interest in the royals is really high it's all anyone wants to speak about we're watching king charles and queen sort we're watching king charles and queen consort camilla you know with a really eagle eye so um I, I think at this stage it's not necessarily apathy i think what are the greatest obstacles okay well i mean let's look close to home there's obviously harry the book the docu-series, I mean, this sort of familial abdication, as I describe it in the book, is, is a real obstacle for Charles because I think we look to the royal family as a symbol of unity, as a family to aspire to and to look up to. And yet, you know, there is this rift at the heart of the House of Windsor. And I think that's absolutely something that's very high up on the agenda for the king to, to sort out because it's also inc incredibly distracting. It's overshadowing a lot of the good work that the royal family are doing. But then there are there are constitutional issues, there are bigger issues um, overseas, the Commonwealth and what that's going to look like under Charles's reign, whether we're going to see that breakdown, whether we're going to see more countries um, follow Barbados and become independents. And I think closer to home, the United Kingdom and the big issue of Scotland, whether that's going to stay part of the United Kingdom. These are all really big issues for King Charles. And he came prepared. You break down a five-year plan. Um, are you seeing pieces of that happening already? Or is that, do we, are we anticipating those, those, mo that to start soon? Because you break down that he's been very well prepared for this moment. Well, I think we're seeing evidence of that five-year plan being executed at really rapid pace. I mean, the first things that he did, making William and Catherine Prince and Princess of Wales, you know, tick, um, the coronation, well, we now know that's going to happen. As I said in my book, he didn't want there to be a long wait before his coronation. It was going to be within about six months of, of his mother's death. I mean, I'm not far off wrong from that. I also say it was going to be, it will be a scaled down coronation, much smaller coronation. It's not going to be a drain on the public purse. It's not going to cost millions and millions and millions of pounds. Um, and, and that seems to be the way that it is going to be going. I think a lot's been made of um, this sort of cutback coronation and I think that you're going to get all the pomp and pageantry that you would expect of a grand historic and ancient crowning which is what this is of, of our king but I think you're not going to get sort of all of the unnecessary hangers-on the 8,000 dignitaries in the abbey well you're going to have 2,000 instead what was a three or four hour service for the queen's coronation will be scaled back to an hour long ceremony and I think these are all indicative of being in a very different time um and and really charles wanting to be um respectful i think of the public mood of the economic crisis that we're in at the moment and um 
I also think there's a sense that we've had so much with the Jubilee, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and then with her funeral, that while the coronation will be a very special moment, and it's not going to try and emulate or match those those previous big moments um, in in royal history. So, but it but it's it is also an incredibly important moment because it is the sort of defining moment, the start of King Charles's reign. But as I say, I think those wheels are already well in motion. He's clearly not going to waste any time getting straight to work, and he hasn't. Um, do I have time for two more questions with you? Yeah, sure. Oh, thank yeah. you so much. Um, one thing I really loved about the book when you're you know painting this picture of the queen for us in the in the 90s in the middle of the chaos probably one of the worst p- points in re- recent history for the royal family you say that the queen said i don't worry about myself i worry about the future mm. i mean does that really define to, to who the queen was as as a woman and as a leader yeah i think it does i mean it was a really startling quote wasn't it and if you cast your mind back to to the 90s when literally the castle's burning down. The family is just at the worst possible place in in its history, or certainly in in the history of the Queen's reign. And yet, you know, she doesn't worry the Queen for herself. She worries about the future. And, um, you know, I think certainly in the later part of her reign, I think she had every faith in the future, actually. I think she'd put the bedrock down, the foundation was solid. She absolutely believed that Camilla should be queen consort and that she'd earned that role. I mean, something that would have been absolutely unthinkable back in the 90s. She had every faith in Charles. She knew that the monarchy was going to be left in good hands. And of course, she had three generations of heirs to survive her. So yes, in the 90s, I think it it all looked pretty grim. Um, But she weathered the toughest of decades and, and came out ever stronger. But that comment's so interesting because... You know, she never worried about herself. She always worried about the institution, about protecting the crown, protecting the reputation of the royal family. And of course, that's now for Prince Charles to continue protecting the reputation, protecting the institution of monarchy. And I know you've discussed in the book, and it was a big deal um, to to royal watchers, Mm. that um, the queen was confused and and could not relate to Harry's decision to leave. Do you also think a part of that was because she knew he was protected in their cocoon and outside in the world, the the palace really could not protect him the way that they had over the last 30 years? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, Kinsey. And I think there's definitely an element of that. I mean, she sort of voiced concerns when Prince Harry started speaking so openly about his own mental health struggles, not because she she thought it was, you know, a conversation that he shouldn't be airing, but she worried that by giving that much away, it would just feed the beast, the media beast, and they'd want more and more, which of course they did. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think her instinct was always to protect Harry, not least because... There were moments when she sort of shift from a grandmotherly role to a maternal role for this little boy who lost his mother at, at such a young age in such tragic circumstances. And I think all she ever wanted to do was to protect Harry. And she, she knew that if they were out and they had to make that decision between being in or out, if they were out, there was far less the Queen could do to, to protect him. But I think also just going back to that quote about how she could never really understand him turning his back on duty. When you think about the queen and how she was thrust into that role as queen at such a young age with no choice, it it wasn't ever up for debate whether or not she'd do it. She was going to do it. And her father had done it. He made sure she was prepared when her time came. So that notion of duty was, it sort of ran through her DNA. And I think there was always a sense of disappointment and, um, and a lack of understanding, I suppose, over what Harry had done, because simply that was just an alien concept to the Queen. She'd never think about abandoning her duty or her birthright. And you've been very um, kind in the way you stress that she always took his calls. She always took his FaceTime. Well, she did. Yeah, yeah there was did. never a time where he was shut out or ignored. No, I don't, you know, because the Queen, as well as being Queen and head of state, and head of the church, she was a matriarch. 
Yeah. She wanted to keep the family together. And I think for a long, well, certainly, you know, in, in, in the most recent times, and um, she has been the one to, to try and keep the Sussexes connected to the royal family. I mean, we know there's very little communication between William and Harry and that relations have been strained between Harry and his father. So I think it's very important for the Queen to keep that thread, you know, with the with the Sussexes across the pond in California. But I also think it's important to stress that there were times where she felt quite let down mm. by Harry and Meghan and quite disappointed by them. And she would always host this um, this sort of lovely weekend at the end of August, a, a sort of big sleepover for her grandchildren and her great grandchildren. And she would always make a point of inviting Harry and Meghan. And, you know, the last couple of summers they they didn't go. And I think things like that, not being together at Christmas, not being together at Balmoral over the summer when the Queen really wanted to bring the family together. I think that hurt her. Oh, that's so sad. Um, Katie, I'm going to let you go, but I really ha quickly have to ask you, did you read Megan's Variety article yet? And if you have, what yeah, is your reaction? Yeah, I, I did, actually. I, I was just on my way back on the tube from some filming and I, I sort of skim read it. I thought it was very interesting what she sort of insinuated about the um, the Netflix? Cut magazine interview. Oh, yeah. just, oh, oh you the know, Cut, you wanted yes. To well, you just wonder whether she, you know, perhaps has any, any regrets about that. Um, that 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 sort of struck out. Um, the comments that she she made about the Queen and the warm relationship that they had, and um, you know, clearly that that her and Harry are sort of very much focused on their their new lives and and what they're doing. She talks about the docu series, although she sort of skirted the issue as to exactly what it's about and what we can expect. Yeah. But I think it's very clear that they are living and loving their lives in in California. And so when people say to me, well, do you think there's ever a way back for them? I think they don't want to come back. And I think that interview sort of makes it very clear that this is their new life. This is what it's all about for them. And have you ever had an In-N-Out burger? And then I promise I'll let you go. <laughs> um, I have had an In-N-Out burger and I'm definitely with with Harry on, on giving them the full seal of approval. And by the way, when he used to live in, in London, he used to love going to McDonald's late at night, often after a night out at clubbing. He um, he does have a bit of a penchant for junk food. And obviously that hasn't that hasn't changed since he's moved to the States. Oh, I love that. And I used to read that his mom would take him there. So that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, Diana, would, like, Diana would take them to McDonald's. She'd take them to the cinema. And, you know, I remember Harry saying to me once, you know, I wish I could just go to get a coffee, go and grab something, get on the tube. And again, you know, it struck me that, you know, you don't really want to get on the tube, right? It's stinky. The high streets are dirty, even in Kensington. And yet this was what he wanted. He wanted this taste of normality. And I think in a way, there is something rather lovely that in California, in Montecito, he can go to the In-N-Out Burger, they know his order, can pull his cap down, um, enjoy his takeout. And I suppose that's about as close to ordinary as it's going to get for him. Perfect. Uh, Katie, I greatly appreciate your time today. I know you've been so busy. And um, the new Royals, it's available on ebook and hard hardcover now. Uh, you can grab it on Amazon. And did I read you were updating it? And if so, um, what can yeah. we expect? Well, I mean, I this book went to print before the Queen had died. So right. I'm in the process, a little bit like Prince Harry, of updating the end and including the Queen's funeral. And I think probably we'll be adding to, to some of those chapters about the, the King's five-year plan and really putting some more detail in that. I mean, I think I've got it pretty right, didn't I, Kinsey, in terms yeah. of the, the prediction, but clearly we know more now. So Absolutely. new and revised editions to come. Watch this space. Well, I can't wait to see that uh, again, too. So, Katie, thank you so much for your time today. You know I'm an admirer of your work, and congratulations on all the book success. Well, thank you for supporting, for enjoying the book, and I can't wait to see you in London soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the To Die For Daily Podcast with Kinsey Schofield. A transcript of this chat is available at todiefordaily.com. Please subscribe to hear more from your favorite royal commentators. Cheers.